So what this means is that when we talk about how Islam nurtures the male soul and the female soul, we have to differentiate the matter further and talk about the different types of male souls and different types of female souls. And I don't have time to do that. But it's worth noting that when it holds up ideal types for the admiration of men and women, Islam holds up a plurality of different ideal types. <coughs> and for women, <coughs> we have the hadith that indicates that there were four women who were absolutely perfect. وَلَمْ يَكْمُلْ مِنَ النِّسَاءِ إِلَّا أَرْبَعَ Sometimes others will be added as de facto members of this uh, elite. Now this provides an interesting contrast, say, with Christianity, where really, at least in the Catholic and Orthodox worlds, there is only one female ideal type, who is the Virgin Mary. And one recurrent theme of feminist reflection, reflection and criticism of Christianity has been that the, the model held up as the woman to be emulated by Christian women cannot actually be emulated. Nobody can be a virgin mother. She was the only one. And this infuses women, according to these Christian, post-Christian theologians, with a sense of hopelessness. That perfection involves transcending their biology. The reason why the Christians believe not only in the virgin birth but in the immaculate conception, that is to say that Mary herself was conceived without sin. It was not just Sidna Isa who was conceived without sin, but um, Mary was conceived without sin, is that the vessel that held the embryo of the incarnate God had to be without sin. God himself, taking human form, could not be nurtured by unregenerate flesh. So, <coughs> she becomes an impossible ideal to emulate. She's on a pedestal, adored, worshipped, but you can't be like her. And she signals to Christian women the fact that their regeneration comes about through the renunciation of their biology, of their sexuality, because she's not a sexual being, and of the normal functions of womanhood. That's a feminist critique, it's frequently heard and it has its force. In the Islamic context, that critique doesn't hold water. It's a point that we haven't usually paid attention to. Because although Sayyidatna Maryam, radiallahu anha, or alayhi salam, depending on how you view her status, was a virgin mother, she, as it were, competes with other models of female perfection who have in practice been more significant as inspirers of the Muslim female desire for a perfect model. And of these others, we have, and the list is an obvious one, Khadija bint Khuwailid, radiallahu anha, one of the Ummahat al-Mu'mineen, mothers of the believers, and it's perhaps worth reflecting that the believers have mothers, but they don't have fathers. Even the Ashara, the ten who are promised paradise, are not called the fathers of the believers. But we have mothers, so perhaps Islam has a matriarchal dimension. One can make that point. The first amongst them, in several respects, is Khadija bint Khuwailid. <coughs> and she becomes really the archetype of <coughs> two things. The woman who trades and is in the world. And also the woman who is the mother, because she is the great matriarch amongst the Ummahat al-Mu'mineen. She is the mother of the four blessed daughters of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Zainab, Umm Kulthum, Ruqayya, and of course Fatima, radiallahu anhum who are themselves models. We know more about some of them than about others. So she is a model for female perfection who demonstrates that acceptability to God and this extraordinary status of being a mother of the believers, with all that that implies, comes about through 
biological fulfillment rather than through negation of the specific, specific features of, of womanhood. Radical departure from the Christian approach. She also incidentally becomes a model for the female who seeks the good pleasure of her Lord through giving charity. وَخَدِيجَتُنَا الْكُبْرَ الَّتِي بَذَلَتْ أَمْوَالَهَا لِرَسُولِ اللَّهِ يَنْتَصِرُ Khadija, the greatest, who spent abundantly of her wealth to support the cause of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And throughout Islamic history, this has been one of the ways in which women in particular have sought taqarrub to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the Prophet himself urged women <coughs> to give much sadaqah. So she's the model for that. Another model is specified again in this hadith of the four women, Asiya. Asiya, a more mysterious figure. We know that she's Imra'atu Fir'aun, she's the wife of Fir'aun. And she's the one who says, Ya Allah, please <coughs> build me a palace in heaven, Baytan fil Jannah, wa najini min Fir'aun mu'amali, and rescue me from Fir'aun and from his works. She remains a faithful wife, but she is praying, and Allah honors her with a historically enormously important role of the rescuing of the helpless infant Musa, alayhi salam. And there's a hadith that indicates that when a woman is mal maltreated by her husband, hers shall be the reward that was given to Asiya. So she also is a role model or an ideal type. In this case, for the traditional Muslim woman, the role model, the consoler, for the woman who is trapped in an abusive relationship. And what greater consolation could there be? So that the hopeless situation of being trapped with an abusive husband and in some madhahib, such as the Hanafi madhab, it is difficult for a woman to get out of that. For the Malikis, it's easier. But there is a glimmer of hope, namely that even this miserable house of obedience can be turned into an, a, a space in which the woman seeks the good pleasure of her Lord by patient endurance and sabr of the bad akhlaq of her husband. That despite the misery of her situation, her future is bright. Other ideal types, Fatima, Umm al-Ahzan, she is our mother of sorrows. The austerity of her life, her poverty, her reflection upon the tragedies that would take place, her grief over the death of her father, very great grief as is documented in the hadith, she outlives him by only six months. She becomes, for Muslims, the model of the perfect woman who is acceptable to God through her tajreed, her absence of any worldly attachments, <coughs> and her lack of joy in dunya. Dunya for her is a source of grief her single-minded approach to the Akhirah and the way in which Allah's providence works for such people through their status as matriarchs because she is of course uniquely privileged as the mother, the ancestress of the Ahl al-Bayt. Without her, where would we be as an Ummah? Without her quality, without the excellence of her upbringing of Al-Hassan al-Hussein, 
and the limitless outpouring of barakah and knowledge and wisdom that comes through Al Hassan and, and Imam Al Hussein, where would the Ummah be? We would be bereft, and we owe this to Sayyidatna Fatima, radiallahu anha. Without the Ahlul Bayt, where would the Ummah be? So many of the great ulama were Ahlul Bayt. So she is another model, the most austere, perhaps the most difficult model that Allah really rewards her in her posterity and in her future. The ajr of all of those ulama, amilin, ulama who acted according to their knowledge and who guided so many countless millions of believers, <coughs> all of that ajr accumulates and goes to her credit. من سن في الإسلام سنة حسنة فله أجرها وأجر من عمل بها إلى يوم القيامة لا ينقص ذلك من أجورهم شيئا Whoever introduces or perpetuates a good sunnah in Islam shall have the reward of that sunnah and the reward of all of those who act by that sunnah until the يوم القيامة So this is the maqam of Sayyidatna Fatima radiallahu anha. <coughs> Other ideal types. A more active type is Sayyidatna Aisha radiallahu anha. <coughs> and it's clear, although we sometimes forget this, that the Rasul alayhi salatu salam liked active feisty women who talked back, who were lively, who weren't just doormats but had a, a mind and a life and a vigour of their own. And she, of all of the women amongst the Sahaba and all of the wives of the Prophet وسلم, despite the requirement in the verse of hijab for their seclusion, had a most public role. So Muslim women today who are wrestling with the problem of how to retain Islam's high standards, the female modesty, demureness, obscurity, and at the same time have jobs, support themselves, be in universities, be, as is inevitable, part of the real world, how that can be squared with the Islamic ethos, Sayyidatna Aisha has proved to many women to be a rewarding, a thought-provoking model. Because as we've already seen after the death of the Mustafa sallallahu alayhi wa she doesn't vanish into mourning or into obscurity. It's clear from the hadith that she is thunderstruck by his death. But she teaches in the mosque, and she becomes one of the great ruwats of the hadith. Again, where would we be as an ummah if we didn't have her hadith? Three or four thousand of the sound hadith in the six main hadith collections are narrated on her authority. Another great women, woman narrator of hadith is, of course, Umm Salama who has a lot of hadith as well, but somewhat fewer than Sayyidatna Aisha, who is really up there with Abu Huraira and Abu Sa'id al-Khudri and the great rawiyas of Islam. And I don't know what the Taliban in Afghanistan would make of this. Had they been around at the time, they would no doubt have told her to go back home. But this was the reality of the Salaf. They did not have our hang-ups. She had precious jewels to spread before the other Sahaba, she wasn't going to keep them to herself. And thanks to her, and to her decision, and to the generosity of the Sahaba, who humbly listened to her, we have those jewels amongst us still. So these are the ideal types of Muslim women. And in every case, these are beyond the reach of any secular feminist carping. Even on their own base terms, which is all about opportunity, 
and respect. They had opportunity, they had respect. On our terms, their greatest glory is their sanctity. The fact that here were women who were utterly wrapped up in their adoration of their Lord, whose great delight was in prayer and in charity and in all the virtues. That is ultimately why we revere them and ask for God's blessings upon them. <coughs>